recently got some courteous, cogent comments from a King James Onlyist, a young leader in King James Onlyism whose name is Kenyon Bowers. Here he is in a picture with two well-known older King James defenders from the King James Bible Research Council. Kenyon is the first person I can think of who has given a clear, straightforward answer to a question I've been asking King James Onlyists for years, which is this. How unintelligible does the King James have to get because of language change before it's time for a revision or an update? I've asked this question probably four score times now in conversations with King James defenders and in videos many times, comments in my YouTube channel. It's hard to describe the bewildering array of non-responses that I get to this question, but not from Kenyon. From him, I got clarity. I got a number, a percentage. Now, at first, the percentage was 100%. Kenyon said that he'd wait till the King James was completely unintelligible in 100 or 150 years, he guessed, to call for a King James revision. He said, I don't think it's that big of a deal if there isn't ever a King James update, nor would I be against an update either. I just don't find the updates to the King James version that there have been to be very good. Now, I have said in the past to a few brethren that if it gets to a point where the King James just absolutely cannot be understood anymore, like in, say, 100 to 150 years from now, that's just a random time frame, then it would be a very good idea to translate the King James Version to whatever that more modern English is, and it would not hurt to reference the Greek and Hebrew. I saw that Kenyon Bowers was really listening and really responding to me. This is incredibly rare when people who don't know each other disagree online. So I kept the conversation going. I didn't address the whole idea of translating the King James itself. I wanted to pursue the question that I've asked for so long instead. I wrote back, I really appreciate your tone, Kenyon. Isn't there a spectrum between fully intelligible English and absolutely cannot be understood anymore? Where are we on the path from the one to the other? I mean, presumably the King James translators used basically then current English. Presumably in 150, I'd actually put it at more like 500 years, English will have changed enough that the King James truly cannot be understood hardly anywhere except by specialists in historical English. Presumably that shift won't happen in a day. It will be a slow process as it has been up till now. So where are we in that process? How far are we down that timeline? And surely you wouldn't wait for the King James to be 100% unintelligible to make a revision, right? So what percentage sounds right to you? How many dead words and false friends should be permitted to stack up before it's really time for churches to switch to a TR-based contemporary English alternative? Am I making sense? To his great credit, Kenyon Bowers yielded. And this is where he gave the first straightforward answer I think I've ever gotten to my question. He responded, yes, you make sense, Mark. To put it bluntly, I'd say around 50% is when we would desperately need an update. As far as where we are on this timeline, it's hard to say, but I'd say that the King James Version is at least 5 to 8%, you know, unintelligible, he means. If I remember, you said around 5% as well, and that's true, by the way, which I think is a fair comparison. When would it be optimal to make a King James update? It seems it would be dependent on how fast the language continues to change, and that's an excellent point. But it would be fair to say any time between 25 to 50 percent is when it would make most sense to update it. Again, I'm not against King James updates, but there are certain things about the King James that are, in my opinion, very important that are dropped from King James updates. I think he's talking about second person pronouns, the versus ye, you know, singular versus plural. Sadly, many King James onlyists don't seem to see the importance of them either, Kenyon says. And then he told me in a subsequent comment, I personally think that 25 percent would be a reasonable time to update the King James. And if the King James did get to that point in my lifetime, I might even try doing it myself, if the Lord allows, of course. I asked Kenyon if he could read Hebrew or Greek. He said, sadly, I cannot yet. If I need a definition, I will mainly use something like Strong's. I do intend to learn both Hebrew and Greek, but I currently can't read either language. So that was progress with Kenyon. I got him down from 100% to 50, and maybe even 25. He might revise the King James himself, he says, though he knows he'd have to learn Hebrew and Greek first. By the end of this portion of the conversation, he actually seemed to settle in at the 25% mark. I helped him get from 100% to 25%. That's 75 percentage points of progress. He said, after an update at 25%, the King James would be back at 100% easy to understand. Now, all this got my nerd motors revving up to full speed. I started to think, what does a text that is exactly 50% unintelligible sound like, or 25%? I wanted to know. 
So I embarked upon a fun experiment. I took some Bible passages, and using what I know about how language changes over time, I changed some words in ways that they might conceivably change in the future. Of course, I'm no prophet. I don't know how exactly English will change in the future. Nobody does, only God. But I know how English words have changed in the past, and English grammar and spelling and pronunciation, etc. So I made the kinds of changes that I've seen in the language so far. Let's just work down the list. We know what a 100% unintelligible text sounds like. It sounds like this. Hwet, hwagardena in gardagum, something something ninga brim gefrunen, hu the apilingas elen fremadon. That's English from Beowulf, but it's 100% unintelligible to contemporary English speakers. Only one word is still used the same way in. I mean, maybe. <laughs> a fair number of these words became words we know, but they're unrecognizable in this state. Many of the sounds are different too. I didn't pronounce them correctly because I don't know how to. Once the King James comes to sound like that, Kenyon is willing to have it replaced. I think most King James only as would be. Or 50%, Kenyon says. So what does a 50% unintelligible text sound like. You'll recognize the passage of scripture that I'm about to read, but will you understand it at 50% unintelligible? Every other word is going to be not contemporary English, not your English, though all the words that I invented for this exercise and all the word order changes that I introduced and all the pronunciations and spellings I altered, all these kinds of changes are based on real observable features of real languages. They are the kinds of things that have happened to English since 1611, or that could happen, because they appear in other languages. I even tried to be consistent, as you'll sort of see. Here are a few 50% unintelligible English Bible verses, one word in every two. For God so drawled a world, aren't he bimmed his only surrected sorrel, that whoever trips in he has unbolted lives? For dest el created not his sorrel into a world to fordeck a world, that but a world though he may be canned. It sure seems like 50% unintelligible adds up to 100% unintelligible. Surely Kenyon wouldn't be happy with a Bible that sounded like this. So what does the English Bible sound like when it's 33% unintelligible? One word in every three. Here we go. Abraham net was good old, and the Lord has bendited him in every quat. He said at the servant senior in his freehold, the one for charge, all of that he rasted, Put them hand under them thigh. I sold you to trafe by the Lord, a god of fent and a god of farrel, that you will yet get the wife for my sorrel from the triltings of Canaanizes, among whom I am herbing, but will go to the country and my own relatives, and Valen and Isha for my sorrel Isaac. Look at some of the things I did. I changed the spelling and pronunciation of not to yet. That absolutely could happen in English as time passes. Vowel changes like that are already common across regions in certain words. Good old could absolutely be the way our great-great-grandchildren say very old. Bendited is just a Latinized English way of saying blessed. Quat is a word I made up, but who's to say that such a word couldn't become common? Servant senior is the word order expected in many languages, noun then adjective. Why couldn't English someday switch to that more common order? The quotation marks around what Abraham says to his servant senior are different than what we use now, if you notice that, but they are used in some Spanish texts. Why couldn't they someday take over in English? The way languages say my when it comes to body parts can differ. In Spanish, for touch my hand, you say touch the hand. So why couldn't them someday be a possessive pronoun equivalent in English? Put, thy, put them hand under them thigh. <laughs> I could go on explaining what I did. I won't for this example. I'll just remind you that every single word in English is in one sense arbitrary. This doesn't mean that you can say whatever your tongue feels like and expect to be understood. Language is a group agreement and not an individual effort. No, what I mean is that there's nothing necessary about the word tree to mean tall, strong, green plant. In Spanish, it's an entirely different set of symbols and sounds that point to the same concept or object, arbol. If the changes I'm introducing in these verses sound outlandish to you, impossible, then you need to work harder to put yourself in the shoes of our ancestors. Think of how our talk would sound to someone from Chaucer's day in the 1300s. It would sound like a bizarre, messed up English, just the way my thought experiments sound to us now. 
like 50% unintelligible, 33% unintelligible still adds up to 100% unintelligible in my mind. Language just breaks down when every third word isn't understandable. So let's try Kenyon's figure, 25% unintelligible, one word in every four. This again is the figure Kenyon Bowers gave me. If the Bible sounded like this, he'd be willing to revise it. Woe to crown of pride, to proctors of Ephraim, whose gloried beauty is a franded flower, which are till the head of the fat travains of those wherein are overcome in wine. Behold, the Lord has a singlier and danglier one, which as the tempest of jelt and a destroying larn, as a flood of muscle waters overflowing, shall nentrify down to earth with the ornacle. The crown of Poral, proctors of Ephraim, shall be trodden odor feet. In that paragraph, I made articles work differently, something more like the way they do in Greek, actually. This is complex. I could explain if we had time, if you were really that nerdy. I changed some nouns. I changed some prepositions, something that definitely happens in languages over time. We can observe this in English, like the mark of the beast is in the hand and in the forehead in the King James. We would say on. I changed some adjectives. I changed some verbs. I tried to vary which feature of language was getting changed throughout the paragraph from parts of speech to pronunciation to word order. I even guessed at a possible false friend that might develop in English someday. Can you spot it? There is method to this apparent madness. And this is a little too fun. We have to keep going. Let's try 20%, one word in every five. The Lord valtronizes dishonest scales. Accurate but weights find favor with him. When inflation comes, then comes yentrix. But with zinchness comes wisdom. The integrity of the astronated guides them. The but unfaithful are destroyed by whose duplicity. Wealth is baffling in the days of Chelt, but righteousness delivers from doornail. And just one more thought experiment. One word in every ten. Ten percent unintelligible. Paul, an Elkin of Christ Jesus, called to be a friendle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised gradually through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his sorrel, who as to his earthly life was a history of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the sorrel of God in power by his creation from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. I think that even this should be intuitively unacceptable for a Bible translation given what 1 Corinthians 14 says, edification requires intelligibility. At 20% unintelligible and even 10%, we still have a text that is effectively impossible to read, or to read well. With a proper dictionary, you can look up Valtronize in this thought experiment, and, and Yentrix, and Zinchness, and maybe just maybe you could guess that astronated means pointed toward the stars, in other words, upright. But reading a Bible that sounded like this would be awfully laborious, and unnecessarily laborious. If people don't know the word Valtronizes, then a word they do know should be chosen instead. And I stuck false friends in both of those 20% and 10% examples. Can you find them? These words in my thought experiment will be more difficult to look up because readers won't realize they're misunderstanding them. This is why I say, my friends, that 5% unintelligible is enough to justify a King James revision. Now, what am I trying to do in this video? I'm not trying to put down Kenyon Bowers, whom I sincerely and genuinely respect for going back and forth with me in good faith with no ad hominem. Do you know how much that meant to me? It meant a lot, I assure you. Kenyon, thank you. What I'm trying to do in this video is to get you viewers out there in YouTube land to step outside your language, to look at it objectively. Now, let me try one more quick little attempt at this before we draw the extreme nerdity to a close. The other day, I watched most of a video by Paul at Langfocus, a nerdy channel that I enjoy sometimes. It was all about the multiple varieties of Arabic. If you don't speak Arabic, you probably have zero feelings invested in the phrase multiple varieties of Arabic. But as he went on to describe, for example, the way speakers of Egyptian Arabic say sa yisafir il urdun bukra, while speakers of Jordanian Arabic would say the same thing this way, safwa yusafir ila lurdun garan, it suddenly struck me that these meaningless, I mean to me, syllables would call forth all sorts of associations for Arabic speakers. I suspect that there are speakers of Egyptian Arabic who regard as simply wrong the Jordanian habit, stupid habit, of saying Gadan for tomorrow instead of the obviously proper Bukra, and their feelings about Jordanians get mixed up in their judgments about Jordanian Arabic, just the way our feelings and assumptions about Southerners or Australians or what have you immediately come unbidden into our hearts when we hear those accents, Southern or Australian. What to us is a very clinical, objective thing, Egyptians say one set of syllables and Jordanians another, is almost certainly a very emotional, personal thing for millions of Arabic speakers. 
Brothers and sisters, try to step outside your English shoes and look at your own language from a dispassionate outside perspective just for a minute. That's what science is supposed to help us do. The scientific perspective is not the only valid perspective on language or on anything. The personal passionate perspective is also valid and important. But I'd say that both perspectives are needed, not just one. What if you were an Arabic speaker and you watched a linguistics video in which the host explained in Arabic that in historical forms of English, people would say, study to show thyself approved unto God. But in contemporary forms of English, people say, do your best to present yourself to God. You would yawn the way I did when I watched that video about Arabic. Honestly, I love language a great, great deal. But even I got bored and skipped portions of that video. If you were an Arabic speaker, the difference between study and do your best would have no emotional resonance for you. They'd be utterly meaningless, just a check mark on some list of stuff to memorize for class. It's because we, including me, are emotionally attached to study to show thyself approved, that we can't see it objectively. Language that we grew up with gained staying power in our hearts. The fact is that, objectively, study in 1611 meant what do your best means today. If you've seen my video on this King James false friend, you'll understand. We need the tools of scientific analysis to see this clearly, not to erase our personal feelings, but to educate and shape them. A last little thought. It's relatively common for King James and TR, Textus Receptus Defenders, to count the length of the critical text of the Greek New Testament, which happens in this edition to be 825,659 characters, to notice that it's shorter than the Textus Receptus at 842,197 characters. And then to point out with alarm that that's equivalent to five chapters missing from the Greek New Testament. The fact is, the TR is almost exactly 2% longer than the critical text. Or if you prefer, the critical text is almost exactly 2% shorter than the TR. TR defenders very frequently call the critical text completely different, or radically different, or drastically different from the TR over a 2% difference in length. I actually don't think this is an appropriate measure. Uh, appropriate analysis for a reason I'll mention in a minute. But let's use this method of argumentation anyway, but apply it to the readability debate. If my King James only brothers are willing to accept a figure of 5% unintelligible for the King James, then they're willing to drop the equivalent of 59 chapters from the Bible. 59 chapters is all of Genesis and nine chapters of Exodus, removed, as it were, because they're unintelligible. Kenyon was willing to say that the King James was 5 to 8% unintelligible. Every percentage point you're willing to go up to is another 12 chapters gone. At 8%, that's 100 chapters of scripture lost to language change. Now, I assume that King James defenders would object to this argument. The fact is that the unintelligible words in the King James are spread around at random, and context has a way of telling you most of what you need to know in most cases. So it really isn't right to say that 59 chapters are missing. But then that's why I don't accept their arguments that rely on mere counting of characters between the critical text and the Textus Receptus. There's no honest way of getting past looking at lots of individual details, reading lots of individual sentences. That's the only way to form an accurate big picture. And that's why we do just that on this channel. We stare and stare at the details of King James Version readability until a big picture emerges. Kenyon Bowers said he was appreciative of that work that I do, generally speaking but he has formed a different big picture from the detailed King James False Friends videos that I've made, a different one than I've formed. He said, even with what you are doing, listing out many false friends, if this continues to happen, that is, these false friends develop, then that's just more words you have exposed that we can then keep in mind as we're reading our King James versions. That leads us back to the question I open with and with which I'll leave you. Kenyon, the King James onlyist, a term he adopts for himself, by the way, says that we can just keep all the false friends in mind. I'm up to 83 now. At what point does the number of words that mean things you can't know to expect because of language change get to be too great? How unintelligible does the King James have to get because of language change before it's time for a revision or update? I'm not satisfied with missing one word in every four.